not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. And as always, we open in the most professional setting possible. Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Comic Reviews. I believe that the audio for the stream is working properly. I'm going to actually check that now, hopefully before anyone's here to see it. And I'm going to try not to leave my head. Hopefully before anyone's... Okay, I think I'm good. I can hear myself talking in my headphones, which seems like the right thing. Anyway. Alright, so uh, this week I don't have a ton, but I don't feel like streaming forever today, so I'm not going to leave too much time before we get started here. I'm going to um, go through the books we're talking about in just a minute, give give people a little bit of time to get here if uh, they just now saw the tweet. Um, of course, follow me on Twitter uh, because I announce when I'm going to be doing the show, uh, what time on there. Let's see here, what else? You can also follow me on Twitter to get uh, you know sneak peeks of what's coming up on Ge Geeky Gentlemen. Um, sometimes we have surprise episodes. There's a Let's Play coming up uh, later this week I'm quite excited about. Uh, you'll, you'll get to see that. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we're working on some stuff and it's always good to follow me because you'll have a better idea of what's happening. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started for this week, huh? So, this week we are talking about Batman White Knight number one. Dark Knights Batman the Dawnbreaker number one. Yeah. Venom number 155. With a lithographic cover. Star Wars Darth Vader number six. Bane Conquest, number six. And capping it off will be Batman, number 32. So it's a very Batman heavy, heavy week right now. Let's see. One, two, three, four books this week are either centered around Batman or Batman characters. So, you know, I got that going for me. In any case, oh, and for the trade this week, we'll also be talking about Paper Cuts Zorro Volume 2, Drownings, by Don McGregor. Okay. Reorganize my stack there a little bit. Make sure it's all nice and pretty. Cool. All right, let's go ahead and get into it then. By starting off with Batman White Knight, number one. Now this one was really interesting to me. I wasn't quite sure what to make of it when I heard about this book coming out. And I know people ask me about it. What you gotta understand about me is I'm a really big Joker fan. Joker is by far one of my uh, my favorite character in comic books. Um, one of the most interesting villains in comic books. Um, one of the best Batman characters. You know, he's on he's on a lot of these lists for me, and so. I really get interested when we have a story that is not only involving the Joker, but is seems to be focused primarily on the Joker. Um, I like a lot of that stuff. And so this week, uh, this, this issue came out, and I've been hearing about it, and the writer-slash-artist, uh, Sean Murphy... Um, had been talking about it, and he said, in the modern culture, it seems like Joker would be the good guy and Batman would be the villain. And I'm not 100% on what he means by that initially. I've got a better idea now. It's hard to really nail down a, a take he has on this, uh, just based on this first issue. Like, it's definitely got some ideas behind it, but I'm not sure how much of it's farce or satire and, and how much of it is meant to be taken as, yeah, this is a legit problem. Um, so, I'm kind of dancing around it, I know. How to put this. Okay, so, in 
in the way that we've portrayed Batman since Frank Miller, there is easily an interpretation in which he is a fascist, he is a psychopath, he is clearly just as bad as his villains, he just happens to be on the right side, as it were, and we've seen him do a lot of things that are like just really messed up, um, both in the comics and the films, all, all over the place. But because of the way in which it is framed, he's always the good guy. His actions are always justified. And so this story takes the approach of what if the dynamic was reversed and Joker was the one who was portrayed in, I'm not going to say a heroic light, but a more sensitive light. And, I mean, of course, the reaction to that is, he's the fucking Joker. He murders people left and right for fun. Yes, you're right. And that, that is the, the kind of underlying argument people are having here is, like, why are we even having this conversation? It's the Joker we're talking about here. He kills people left and right all the time. And that's kind of being used to, to try to undercut a lot of what's being said here. That's the argument people throw out here. But the wider point is, that may be true, but look at this other guy, Bat that being Batman, and all the problems that he is causing. Is he really better than the Joker? And so, I think a lot of that is really sum uh, summarized in this opening scene. We have, you know, very classically, the Batmobile driving up to Arkham Asylum stopping in the front and the guards escorting a man through the asylum to a cell but here's where it gets different inside the cell is batman walking into the cell is a reformed joker That scene is very reminiscent of a lot of stuff in Batman. The most notable example, of course, being um, The Killing Joke. That entire opening sequence is just Batman walking into Arkham Asylum and, you know, going into the Joker's cell. And so that, I, I feel like that scene kind of captures and, and flips uh, around a lot of these ideas. The other thing that happens in this is Joker leads Batman on a chase throughout, throughout the city where Batman literally does things we've seen him do in a lot of different movies and, and comics and stuff. So he jumps his car over a drawbridge, jumping over a ferry. Okay, fine, it's it's cool dynamic action shot, sure, but there's the, the actual context. If he missed the jump, his car would have crashed into that ferry and people could have been hurt. That's fucked up. Um, then Joker, like, very, very much uh, pointing its finger at Batman Begins, Joker uh, jumps over some rooftops and Batmobile, and Batman drives the Batmobile on top of the rooftops. And he's got Barbara in the car and she's like, how do you know that the house won't crumble on the people living in there and all this stuff? And again, it's, it's right out of Batman Begins. He's driving on rooftops! Um, it's, it's right out of that. It's like, yeah, it's a cool scene when you're watching it, but like if you think about it, people could get hurt. <laughs> uh, and yeah, maybe he's going to catch a guy who's, who will also hurt people if given the opportunity. But how could he possibly be sure that what he's doing will not put pe more people at a greater risk, right? And I mean, this thing, like, it, it works here. It's a conceit here for the story that is asking for only a certain level of realism that other comics ask you to suspend, you know, suspension of disbelief. Um, so when you watch Batman Begins, the suspension of disbelief is to be either, okay, there aren't people in those buildings... Or somehow or another, Batman knows that he 
his car is perfectly capable of, of jumping over this bridge and missing the ferry and all that stuff. There's, you know, that's just kind of the, the suspension of disbelief. Batman wouldn't do that kind of thing. And, and you know, it's it's reasonable. Like, every, every story has that. If you overanalyze stuff too much, you're always going to be setting yourself up for a problem. Um... And so, you know, it's just, it's worth thinking about, it's worth looking into. Overanalyze stuff too I'm much, you're always going to be setting yourself up for a problem. That was going on or not. Um, um, no, but so, it you know, it's just, it's, it's worth, worth thinking about, it's worth looking into. Overanalyze stuff too I'm much, you're always going to be setting yourself up for a problem. That was going on or not. Um, but then there's the final scene that happens in this book, which is, um, or the final scene... There's another straw that happens within this, where while chasing the Joker past a construction crew, Batman nearly takes out the crew, and it, the only reason he doesn't is because Nightwing comes into the last second and saves somebody. And so it's just like he really looks unhinged. And so he chases the Joker into this chemical plant. And he knocks over a security guard and his, like, determination to go take the guy down. And inside this uh, plant that has a bunch of pills, he and the Joker start to fight. And they have a conversation. And the Joker's words here are pointed, um, to say the least. Ugh. Joker's talking about the relationship that he and Batman have. Batman says, there is no relationship. Now who's crazy? We're Gotham's favorite power couple. And like any couple, we're supposed to fight. Uh, where's a, we're a team, Bats. Admit it. That's our dynamic. All that's missing is the makeup sex. I don't expect you to acknowledge it. You are, after all, the distancer. I'm the overly complicated one. You only pretend we're a team because it gives you purpose and makes you feel special, but your ego won't let you see the truth. And what's that? You don't matter. Not to me, not to Gotham, not to anyone. Ouch. Cards on the table, huh? Is this the part where we get to be completely honest with each other? Because I don't have to hold back. You're not holding back. You've got nothing left. After all these years, you still have no idea what I'm capable of? I could have beaten you at any point, turned the city completely against you whenever I wanted, but I chose to hold back, giving you only what you could handle, because I didn't want to have to wreck what we had. Admit it. I gave you Gotham City. This corrupt war zone, the home we created together, the only reason Gotham allows you to exist is because they're so terrified of me. Admit it, I'm the only one who knows you, Batman. Your vigilantism isn't about justice, it's about control. Fixing this city is your pathetic way of salvaging the broken bits of your anima. But you're too stupid to see that it hasn't worked. Crime has become your therapy and Gotham your victim. You've dragged us all into your own perpetual Halloween. Admit it, you can't even build a family because the very thought of one terrifies you. How many, how many innocent children will, ru will, ruin, will you ruin with your nightmare? Is that Nightwing or Robin? I've lost track because they keep disappearing. Even Gordon is fed up watching his men turn into cannon fodder on the front lines of a war they didn't ask for. It's all falling apart and you're incapable of stopping it. Admit it. Face it. The greatest villain in Gotham City is you. And I mean, this is nothing new with the Joker uh, to, to get inside Batman's head this way. And during the entire scene, Batman's just pounding him to a pulp on the ground in front of the police and um, Nightwing and Batgirl. Um, I'm trying to figure out who it is that takes video of it. But it's someone. Um... In any case, I've got an idea of who it might be. Uh, spoilers. 
not for this issue. It doesn't happen in this issue. I'm just warning potential spoilers if you don't want speculation. Because they purposefully keep her face in shadow. But they allude to her later on in the issue. And this definitely seems like something that um, that could be done with the character. Uh, I think it might be Harley Quinn. Anyway. I just need to look at one thing real quick. Or maybe I'm just completely wrong and I missed something. Um, it's really, really hard to tell. Gordon's got this woman detective. I think it's supposed to be Ramirez with him throughout the whole thing. But is she there in the end? Hmm. You don't see her at the end, but you don't see Gordon either. In any case, yeah, I think it might be Harley Quinn that videotaped the conversation. The um, Joker says, if I wanted to be better, I could, you know, completely fix Gotham. Um, and so Batman actually takes like a bottle of pills that's just on the warehouse floor and shoves them down Joker's throat before getting up and leaving the, the cops to take him away. Um, and then a video of the whole encounter gets leaked online and you got the press doing the whole talking heads thing. And this is the point at which I'm a little unsure about what exactly the writer is in particular trying to say here. I'm not sure if this is satire or if he's like actually trying to make the, the point that Batman's a bad person the way that we portray him. Um, and so like there's this line between the talking heads. Uh, they're talking about police corruption and how the GCPD is still corrupt. And this guy goes, that was the previous commissioner. Gordon has been working hard to overturn public opinion. The SJWs just need to give him a chance. At this point, the only people using the term SJW are either using it ironically or are kind of crazy and, and uh, kind of crazy right-wing assholes. Um, there's there's really no middle ground anymore. It's it's pretty much just those are your options now, um, and so having this come out of a talking head in a comic book gives me a certain connotation, and another scene in the book gives me maybe a little emphasis on that connotation. I just need to read more of this before I can give uh, a reasonably good read on where I think this writer is trying to come down on this, uh, on, on what exactly he's trying to portray this as. This, a, a lot happens in this book, by the way, because I'm not even, ha I'm only at the halfway point. Um, so anyways, this like way that Batman treated the Joker becomes like a really big burning issue. And I love this page, by the way. There's a lot communicated in this page. Um, though I should say, this does a thing that I don't like, uh, just in general that things do, and it, um, it gives Joker a pretty definitive origin. It's very uh, reminiscent of Batman 89 here. There's a lot of imagery straight out of Batman 89, like the uh, hand right there, and then... If I go, yeah, over the next page, we got some uh, references to the movie right there and there. As well as some other stuff down here. Uh, animated series as well gets a reference. So, anyway, this, this does call him Jack Napier. Uh, and it, it seems to be giving him pretty definitive origin. I don't particularly like that. This seems to pretty much just be off on its own. Um, the way they're talking about this, they're not mentioning a lot of the other things. They say at one point the Joker has only been convicted of armed robbery. Um, psh, hell, uh, that he's never killed a guard or a nurse in Arkham, stuff like that. I'm like, hell no, that's not true for mainline continuity Joker. Um, so this seems to be kind of off in some things. That's... It's whatever. It's not. It's just a personal preference thing for me. 
Again, I want to mention the art on this page, though, because I really, really like this page. Just a lot visually is communicated here with very little uh, actual text. He's not the one I'm worried about is the only text that's on this. But then you have this little poster here, Why Don't You Love Me? You get these newspaper articles. That little card right there says Jack Napier falls into acid. Um, so it's a pretty wordless page, all things considered, but there's just a lot of imagery here that I really like that kind of tells a story of like, okay, comes to town to be a comedian, um, falls into acids, like becomes the Joker that we know. Uh, Harley's obviously involved, blood dripping, him sitting on the floor of his cell. Um, or no, it's laying in bed in a cell. Just a lot of that really works for me. I always love things that show the Gotham skyline and make it Batman. So that's really cool. We got like the uh, the Gotham City skyscrapers, like kind of you know disappearing into the night sky, but it forms Batman's silhouette. So there's a lot here that I just really really enjoy. Uh, yeah, go ahead and move on. I mean, I, I certainly question this from, like, a real-world realism standpoint. This, like, this is kind of the thing where, um... This is the other thing where, like, it's, it's asking you for a certain level of realism, but then... It has, the Joker has all these Batman toys and, and stuff in his cell. And, like, that's just, of course, not very realistic. Uh, let's see, I got some live comments. Sean Staruki, Staruki, Staruk. Uh, I'm reading it as an Elseworlds title. I liked it more than I thought, enough to get the next issue. Yeah, I wasn't sure what to think about this, but this definitely has intrigued me and makes me want to follow up with it. Uh, Robert Emmett says, Batman the Dawnbreaker should have been named Batman Edgelord. We'll get there. Uh, I've got a lot to say about this one, though. So we get, like, a reveal for why Batman's so reckless in this continuity, which, again... This scene in particular, uh, along with the SJW comment, makes me think I know where this writer's coming from, but I'm not 100% on it yet, because it's revealed that Bat that Alfred is suffering from the same disease that uh, Nora Freeze is. So, you know, it's Batman 89 references, Batman and Robin subplot going on here. Um, and certainly, uh, Batman's always been more extreme when uh, his family is threatened uh, or, or hurt. Uh, after Jason Todd and after Davian's death, Batman was putting himself much, much more in the um, in the path of danger. Um, just a lot of stuff like that's going on. And so this seems to maybe give some kind of reason as to why he's acting so extreme, so he's not like 100% out of character. Uh, but anyway, Leslie Tompkins says that the Joker seems to be mentally cured. That something about the pills that Batman forced down his throat cured his mental illness. Um, and now he's researching his own legal case and plans to sue the GCPD, Gotham City, and Batman uh, for the mistreatment of him and the enabling that uh, the city has done of Batman. And so his final conclusion is, I love Gotham, and it's time I paid her back for the debt owed by the Joker. The city deserves better than you, better than the Joker, and better than the Dark Knight. So I'm going to be her White Knight. And that's the conclusion of the issue. Ah, oh, it's Harley on the cover. I didn't even realize. Um, I'm I'm curious to see how this goes. I am I am color me intrigued. Let me put it that way. I don't a hundred percent know where he's going with this. What he's trying to say a hundred percent. But I am definitely on board. Uh, let's talk about the art just a little bit more. 
because we have a the writer is the artist on here and i really like the way that that a lot of this is done it's got a great atmosphere to it and just some like cool looks like i like the design of the batmobile here uh quite a bit there's a pretty good look at it you know it's got kind of an animated series vibe to it with the really elongated front the front end i like that I'm always a sucker for imagery like this up here, uh, Batman and chains and stuff like that, uh, in a cell and Arkham's, just, I'm a sucker for that kind of thing. Flipping the dynamic, it's obvious, but it's cool, I don't care. Um, Joker in a Batman t-shirt, great imagery. Again, I talked about that, that huge page of, um... Like everything he's been through, but like this panel of the Joker's face. Joker bloodied to a pulp is something I enjoy incredibly. I think it always looks great when Joker's just beaten to death. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite things. Um, that's a really great page, and it's perfectly capturing everything that's going on in the story. Everything It pulls your eye directly where you want it to, which is you're focused on this, not everybody else behind them. But then as you start to look at the image more, you realize everyone's just standing there watching him do this, and that's pretty messed up. And so it's, it's you know, creating a level of sympathy for the Joker. Oh. Uh, yeah. A lot of good stuff here. Very dialogue-heavy book for a writer-artist, you know? Uh, a lot of the, the artists tend to just try to communicate more through the visuals. This is very dialogue heavy or, or text heavy just generally, but it works. It's uh, it's a nice read. I'm, I'm pretty happy with this so far and I'm really curious to, to see more as it goes. Hmm. Yep, all right. I've spent about half an hour talking about this book already. Damn, whoops. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to Batman, the Dawnbreaker. Uh, this is another DC Metal, Dark Knights, whatever tie-in. Um, I'm not reading this event at all. I read the Suicide Squad issue for Cedric Art. I read this issue because Batman Green Lantern is one of my favorite things. Hold on one moment. And I will show you... There we go. Oops. Yeah, so this from um, the, what, sixth issue of John's run, sixth or seventh maybe, uh, figure based on the time Batman put on a Green Lantern ring, and I love it. It's awesome. Uh... <laughs> uh so I just, I don't know, I always get off on Batman and Green Lantern stuff since I think they have a fun dynamic and, you know, you put Batman in a Green Lantern suit, I gotta, I gotta pick it up for some reason or another. Let's see, can he chill back here without falling over? Maybe, we'll see. Uh, this is also kind of a cool cover where it's got like this uh, foil, I think you call that, this where like only in certain light can you see the whole image so i'm trying to reflect the light the right way for you so you can see all these like monstrous things behind him there you go that's a pretty good one uh okay so like this is basically just an origin for what happened to make uh this evil batman exist and so the waynes are killed in an alley uh, Bruce is instantly numb to the to all feeling, including fear, and so he overcomes his fear, and that you know gets him selected by the ring, and he immediately goes to try to kill Joe Chill, but the ring says no, lethal force is not allowed. But he's like, I don't care, just kill him, just kill him now. And so he's got so much will at that point, it overpowers the programming of the ring and allows darkness to seep into it. I have no idea what that means. 
I'm assuming it's connected to the whole metal thing, that there's like the darkness or whatever. Um, and so he's able to, to use the ring lethally and to do some kind of fucked up stuff for it when he briefly, I think, resurrects his parents. I hope it's briefly. Um, and so that's, I don't know, that's an interesting idea. Uh, get some references to stuff here, like you got, he takes out Scarecrow, and we get this reference to an old issue of, uh, Green Lantern. <laughs> um, anyway, so he kind of just goes off and, and kills his villains, like, just takes the penguin up into the atmosphere and murders him because he's a bad person now. He just doesn't give a fuck. Uh, Gordon tries to talk him down and say, you can't do this. It's not justice. And he just fucking ends Gordon. Um, the Guardians of the Universe and the Green Lantern Corps show up and he summons the darkness from within the ring and destroys them. Which is pretty fucked up. And then at that point decides to become something else. A bat. The Dawnbreaker. And he's got his own oath. I kind of like that. With darkness black, I choke the light. No brightness, no brightest day escapes my sight. I turn the dawn to midnight. Beware my power, Dawnbreaker's might. And there's like just, you know, Shiver with Shiver, Shiver. Uh, uh, it, you know, Shiver's art with Green Lantern and bats and all, all this imagery is, is really cool. I like this. Um, and then as his world is consumed by the darkness that overcame the ring... The Batman who laughs shows up and says, Hey, Neil, join me and we'll go destroy a world that's full of light. And so he shows up to, you know, main DC Earth and is about to fight Hal. Hal's unable to defeat him. Uh, Dr. Fate saves Hal's life in order to save the multiverse. And we're left with this uh, image of the Dawnbreaker or laying, initiating blackout, initiating, uh, pulling all light away from this world. A world of light, a city of hope, disgusting. Let them feel helpless. Let them feel the void. Let them feel like me. And so he's like allowing all these construct style demons of darkness to roam uh, Coast City, and as he's zapping away, all light. Shiver's art is always really cool. I mean, this design for, like, an evil Green Lantern Batman's really interesting. Uh, Shiver, of course, being kind of the one that went, okay, the costume's not fabric, black is black. So, like, the actual black, the lack of line of definition the just stark black of the suit really makes a lot of the other colors uh stand out which is really cool um the monsters are great too like i love the they they do remind me of the um Ah, uh, what is it? The inversions um, from Green Lantern continuity, so that's cool. I'm really impressed with the way that the uh, the shading and the lighting, I guess, works here. Again, I really, really like this panel of young Bruce in the Green Lantern outfit, you know, kind of being consumed by bats. It's neat. I'm not reading the rest of the crossover. I have no interest in where this is going. I just wanted to read one issue with Batman as an evil Green Lantern. 
<laughs> Deadpoolzilla is kind of on point with this. Dark Knight's metal is just to give Batman cosplayers more ideas, isn't it? Yes. That. <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. So yes, you can cosplay as this Green Lantern Batman or this Green Lantern Batman now. You have those, you have options. I have time to say about that. I picked it up because eh, it's Green Lantern Batman. It can't be too awful. Alright, let's go ahead and go on to Venom number 155. It's not the Amazing Spider-Man uh, Brand New Day. It's Venom number 155. <laughs> Lenticular covers are too much fun. This one doesn't work as well. It's something about it, like I had a hard time being able to um, to see what, what exactly was going on here. Anyway, um, I want this book to be good. I really do. The last issue gave me hope that it was it was getting better. But then this issue I don't know how to feel about. This issue is not as bad as the whole Dinosaur Men story arc. It's got good in it. But it's got Dinosaur Men in it. The fuck? Why do we keep going to Dinosaur Men in this? <sighs> so anyway we got a bunch of guys in prison talking about okay we'll fight someone who's a super villain but doesn't have any superpowers inside and so they're gonna go fight Lee yeah Lee you remember him from when this book was good and so they, they go to fight Lee, and Lee just kicks the shit out of him, and is like, do you think I need powers to beat you? You have no idea. I'm like, okay, cool, this book is back on track. I'm interested to see what Lee is, is going to do, what his plans are. And then we go, and we're dealing with Venom on the streets of New York. He wants to... Uh, you know, attack a cop who's, uh, attack a dirty cop, basically. And he's talking to the guy and he goes, That man peddles in drugs and death, but you, you're worse. You've sworn to protect and serve, but you've betrayed that oath. Your punis punishment must be special. We will eat your brains! Okay. And he's like, no, I can't do that. I gotta get control. Gotta go take my medicine that makes the symbiote not go crazy. Alright, fine. Cool. I'm still with this book. But then the symbiote says, Yo, Eddie. I'm hungry. He's like, okay. We'll work on something for you. As that he tries to get a job in journalism and ends up working for a schlock newspaper. So what does Eddie do to get the symbiote food? Well, I go hang out with the dinosaur men, of course, in the sewers. Why are we going back to dinosaur men? Ah, there's a fight, there's craziness, some shit goes down, ah, fuck if I care, I, I really don't, I don't care to summarize that, we get a teaser at the end that's entirely too long, that says Craven's going to New York to hunt dinosaur men in the sewers, I don't care about the dinosaur men! Why is this happening? 
Diplozilla, why are there dino men here anyway? I don't know. I, I honestly cannot tell you why there are dinosaur men. Like, I know the, the reason that the plot gives, but, like, why they thought that would be a good idea, I cannot possibly explain to you. It's like, it seemed like we were back on track for the last issue. The beginning of this issue is pretty solid with that. And then, dinosaur men. You're on track, and then Dinosaur Man, you're off the track. It's annoying. Oh, wait, I didn't talk about the art at all. Uh, I don't have a ton to say about it, honestly. Lee cannot get a consistent design. Sometimes he looks like... He's on an anime, other times he's, or this issue, he just looks, you know. Besides the, the hair coming down the front of his face, he just does not look like the same character. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh. What else can I say about the art? Like the art's certainly not the problem. This is uh, a cool look at Venom. Um, I don't know. The dinosaur men look fine for dinosaur men. I just don't want to see dinosaur men. It's, it's a cool panel right there. It's cool action, but that's not what I was interesting about this book. Oh, man. Deadpool's all says, it looks like Mark Bagley. Um, who's doing the art for this? Mark Bagley. You're on point. Alright, let's go ahead and go on to Star Wars Darth Vader number 6. I liked how last issue ended. This issue isn't bad, but you know what we're back to? We're back to the video game plot. We're, we're back to the video game that this book is. I'm convinced that Charles Soule wanted to write a Darth Vader video game, and if he did, I'd probably be in love with it. Uh, I, I, I would find a lot to enjoy about this. But, <laughs> it's a comic book. Uh, okay, okay. Here's where I'm going to explain why this is a video game. We start with Palpatine looking at Darth Vader's armor. And then seeing Darth Vader in the back to tank, congratulating him on getting the lightsaber. And he says, the droids will be in soon to fix your armor. And Vader looks at him, and Palpatine says, oh yes, I sense your ang- uh, Hold on, I should do it in my Palpatine voice. Ah, I sense your anger. I should have known. This armor is you. It is only appropriate that you should make it your own, especially with your skill as an engineer. Adjust the suit as you see fit, my apprentice. When you are ready, come to me. There is work to be done. And so, like, this is a cool scene where Vader, in his back to tank, adjusts his armor using the Force. But here's the thing about that. That would be an even cooler mini game in a video game where that's how you upgrade your stats as Darth Vader. Where your your limit to being as powerful as possible is you're not used to your armor yet. So you are making adjustments throughout the game after each mission to make your armor work better via a mini game. That's how you're you're raising your stats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Deadpool still says, it's a goddamn upgrade menu in a game. It is. It totally is. It's like, okay, speed, strength, force use, light, like, it's lightsaber. It totally is. It's, it's hilarious. This is such an upgrade menu, man. And, like, it's it's a cool scene for Vader to be in the back to tank, and he's using the tools of the Force and all that stuff. Like, you could integrate the upgrading of the suit into a minigame thing where you gotta, like, do things very carefully. Uh. I don't know, it's just, it's too funny that that is such an upgrade thing. And then, completely and totally, without excuse, disconnected from that, we get a transition to the Jedi Temple with the Grand Inquisitor walking around. He's like, I remember lies, I remember lies. And Vader is summoned to go fight him. And they fight. Uh, you know, the Inquisitor does his whole rotating saber thing, double saber bullshit. Um, and he's like, I'm too powerful for you. Invader says, no, I was just testing my armor, and then trashes him. Mini-boss? That, that's a mini-boss, right? Like, it's, it looks like a fun mini-boss, but that's a mini-boss. But just at the last second, Palpatine stops Vader from killing him, and explains what the Inquisitors are. And then they go across Coruscant, and we see all the Inquisitors, and Palpatine gives you a new mission <laughs> to train the Inquisitors to hunt down the last remaining Jedi in the galaxy. It's a fucking video game! <laughs> it's like, okay, here's your training room to get better. And here's your, your partners that you're going to be training against and working with on missions. <sighs> I'm just going to call up Lucasfilm like, Hey, when are you adapting that Charles Soule comic into a video game? <sighs> I just so don't know what this is anymore it's just like what the shit <laughs> oh. Deadpool Zola says I guess you're hitting quit game on this series I don't know it's not like so bad that I hate it it's not like ludicrously expensive it's only a four dollar comic I know I must be rich um it's not like restrictively expensive or anything. I, I have fun talking about it, even though I think it's kind of silly. Uh, it's certainly got its moments that are pretty awesome and cool. I just like, I'm going to keep making fun of it for being a video game as long as it continues to be a video game. Um, I, I still want to be a dick right now. Just tweet to Charles Souls like, I really like your video game pitch. When is it going to get turned into an actual game by Lucas Lucas Arts? <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not gonna do that, but that's just what it feels like. It's so... I don't know, like, maybe it just needs a whole text issue, like... This issue didn't advance really anything when you think about it, though. Plot-wise, like... Vader's now told to train the Inquisitors. Vader adjusts his armor. Those are the plot points of this issue. That's nothing. That is so nothing. Um, but the art's really cool looking. I, I like the silhouette of Vader. It's neat to see Vader fight the Inquisitor. Uh, hey everyone, you're going to see this on the um, Star Wars Explains channels pretty soon here of what was it like when Vader first met the Inquisitor? You can just go read this yourself instead. Uh, I mean, I, I like that Vader figures out how to exploit 
the fundamental flaw of the Inquisitor's um, rotate lightsaber thing in like two seconds, whereas it took Kanan like two season or a full season. Um, the the shading on Palpatine's weird here. Look at like the shading above his forehead there. It's too much inking. It's it's it just looks like it like ran or like you used marker and it got too full. It doesn't look like shadow. It's too dark. Um, there's way too much shadow on Palpatine though. Uh, I don't really care about a lot of what's happening here. We get all these Inquisitors, whereas like most of these characters are dead. But you know, whatever. I don't know who this Jedi is. She doesn't look as intimidating as the last Jedi, though. Oh yeah, Nathan Snyder's talking about the the sabers as helicopters. Yeah, that was the the limit where I'm like, no, no, that's too much. Even for Star Wars, that's just too much. You need like I'm, I have no problem with them like being used to stabilize flight, like you know to to stabilize descent, but to be able to ascend with them, you need to establish it's not the saber doing it. It's like a force push or something because that's just too much. Like, could a person even hold on to something that was creating that much downward thrust? Uh, Deadpoolzilla says, it's Jocasta New, the Jedi Librarian. <laughs> hold on, wait, wait, wait. Jocasta knew the Jedi Librarian, according to Emperor Palpatine. You and the Inquisitors must find these Jedi, Lord Vader. You must destroy them all. For in truth, there is no greater threat to the Empire than Jocasta knew the Jedi Librarian. Palpatine's voice. Does anyone can anyone do Vader's voice? Because I would really like to create a sketch where it's like I just say that and then Vader's like Oh uh, come again <laughs> Okay. Alright. Oh, that's too funny. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about Bane Conquest number six. This is the series I'm probably going to pull the plug on. Um, the only reason I was picking this up is because you people said you wanted to hear me talk about it. Um, so I'm going to ask right now. Do you still want me to talk about this? I'll obviously talk about this issue. Do you still want me to talk about this book month to month? Because right now I've got a number of reasons to drop it. And if you guys don't care to hear me talk about it anymore, then I have very little interest in continuing to read it. Um, so, like, the, the main reason I want to drop it is just because it's fucking boring and stuck in the 90s and I just do not care. I, I'm sure someone enjoys this. It's not me. Um, the other reason is I don't care if Chuck Dixon... Um, if, if Chuck Dixon is a conservative or what the fuck ever. That's fine. It's, there's this, like, alt-right Kickstarter campaign for, like, a... Confederate flag-wearing chick superhero 
which is weird and kind of creepy, especially after all the shit that went down in Charleston and Chuck Dixon gave money to that campaign and was like, good luck to you guys, it sounds great what you're doing. And it's like clearly just this attempt to like make a, a conservative-leaning book, which I, I don't care if you want to make a conservative-leaning book, but an alt-right, which is pretty much just this day, you know, white supremacist. Um, no, fuck that, and I don't really want to be giving my money to something that Chuck Dixon is writing. I mean, ultimately, it's not a ton's going back to him, and if sitting here and trashing his book week to week um, is something you guys enjoy, I'll still do it. But I just, if you don't care, I cannot muster up the strength to keep reading this. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, so in this issue, we have the Nadja Nadja. <laughs> um, who is the, like, cult leader messiah of cobra this organization that's a world player that bane is trying to track down um and he's being all bane and badass like as he track it, tracks these people down look at him carry this chinese gangster by the throat or no yeah yeah chinese um and i mean like it's just such a isn't Bane cool <laughs> kind of book <laughs> that makes no sense. It's just trapped in the 90s. So apparently Cobra worships this guy that they call the Naja Naja, which is just a stupid name. Um, uh, and like they worship him until the instant of his death. And they believe the instant he dies, his essence is transferred into a new uh, into a newborn who was born the exact same instant. Um, what the fuck ever? I don't. I, I mean, like, your leader is an infant. Your leader is like a four year old. Your leader is a child for twenty years. That's weird. And like I, I know people are gonna be like, "What about the Dalai Lama?" Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. But here's the thing: he doesn't lead an international criminal organization that's supposed to have been around for thousands of years and influencing things left and right and trying to, you know, destabilize world governments. That just seems like it, it needs a higher caliber than someone who sits and reads things and tries to create great app yeah, tries to get a greater understanding of a religious philosophy so this is a b like the dalai lama but it's for crime the dalai lama of crime i so want to hear chick dixon's pitch for this book so then six issues halfway through the series they're going to go up against the Dalai Lama of crime. <laughs> um, who is like, also, like, not only is he the Dalai Lama of crime, but like, he's also spoiled. Like, let me just read this exchange, because I do not know what to make sense of it. The portents are, for bo are foreboding. You must not leave, revered one. To hell with your portents. This, it is simply the yachting event of the season. The Rafi of Lagamantpur has invited me to be on his crew. It is not judicious to be so exposed, Naja Naja. I am young. It is my life to live, Rambo. I want to enjoy the power of my position. <laughs> The Dalai Lama of crime wants to go to the yachting event of the season. <laughs> I don't feel too bad making fun of Chuck Dixon. This is pretty stupid. Um, 
So anyway, Bane like a badass rams a boat onto the yacht and kidnaps the Naja Naja and he's gonna take him and kill him once and they're also gonna find the infant that he's gonna be born to and I guess kill a baby. Uh more ultra badass 90s art right up here look at that look at that machine gun oh uh, he's carrying another man on his shoulder because because being such a manly man uh what this is anymore uh anyway during their attempt to escape cobra's got a submarine that they use to uh to stop him and so next issue, The Coils of Cobra, which from the live comments, I'm probably not going to be reading. If anyone in the, if anyone watching this after the fact begs me to keep reading it, if only just to make fun of it, fine. But, you know, it's a $4 book. I could be spending that money more wisely. Huh. <sighs> Chuck Dixon with his silliness and, and Graham Nolan with his 90s. What has Graham Nolan done since the 90s? Because it does it, it feels trapped in the 90s, or they I guess they just both wanted to time travel. Alright. Let's go ahead, move along. So the final issue this week, which is Batman number 32. Oof. This is an interesting issue because it's very art and action heavy. Um, there is dialogue in it, but it comes right at the tail end. So Batman's sitting here thinking about the conclusion of of his story thinking about all the lives lost in the war of jokes and riddles and thinking about the ultimate uh, moment of the war where he quote unquote um, made his greatest mistake and Selena being there gives him the confidence to go on with the story so there's a fight between the Joker, Batman, and the Riddler all at the same time. Which, I mean, it's it's interesting that this is the issue with so much action and, and um, like, just direct punching action visuals on, on panel. Um, because the thing about this book... A lot of the way through has just been there's very little action it's all kind of after the fact or before the fact there's very little things happening on the page um and so this is kind of the the longest most drawn out we've seen any of the, the battles of this war be uh so anyways batman Beats Riddler down. Riddler begs for mercy. And, um, as he's begging, he asks, is the Joker laughing yet? And then Riddler reveals, like, this major fucking thing that he knew about the whole thing with Kite Man, what Batman's plan was. He set it up. He planned Batman's plan for him. Um, he did it all to try to make the Joker laugh. He killed Kite Man's son, uh, just trying to make the Joker laugh. Don't you get it? Do I have to explain it to you? Are that st are you that stupid? Um. But you, the man who laughs at anything, but who now can't laugh at anything... That's, that is an opportunity. That's a riddle I want to solve, that I did solve by making this war, by losing this war, and you, you should be laughing.
so Riddler does all of this just to satisfy his own curiosity of the Joker's not laughing anymore. The Joker's lost what makes the Joker the Joker. And to try to make the Joker laugh, he tears the city apart to satisfy his own desire to know an answer. Um, tears the city apart, ruins someone's life, turns them into a villain, and does it all just to, for himself. And Batman, realizing this, is so angered that he goes to stab the Riddler in the face. Now let me stop there. Because I have no doubt in my mind that people, and, you know, reasonably so, are going to say that Batman would never do that. Batman would never try, like, would never allow himself to get so torn away that he would go over the edge like that. And and it's not like a mistake or anything. King spells it out right here. It wasn't an accident. I didn't think I'd fail. I wasn't out of control or insane. I knew who I was. I knew what I was doing. I understood the choice I'd made. I thrust the knife out to kill the Riddler. Very much intentional on his part. And I will say, like, I will understand people saying, I don't like to see Batman do stuff like that. I think there are some contextual things in this. Because, I mean, when I was reading this, I was like, oh, that's, that's harder to swallow for me. Um, but in thinking about it, I think there's some contextual things that that really make this not only work, but there's kind of a precedent for it um several times in the history of batman batman has gotten very very close to that edge to actually um to actually getting ready to murder someone uh be it the joker or one of his other villains um an example that comes to mind is the scene in Hush, which, you know, it's not a great book or anything, but this scene isn't the problem with it. Um, where he's... Joker has just killed Thomas Elliot, and so Batman is literally pounding him to a pulp in an alley, planning to murder him, and Jim Gordon stops him. Th this happens uh, in Batman. There's there's other examples you can go to. That's just the first one that comes to mind for me. So the idea that he knows what he's doing as he's about to go over the edge is nothing new. There's also the context of this is early days Batman. He's not been through the trials of the soul that we've seen so many times. Um, this is all new to him, relatively speaking. This is not some being this close to to ending someone is not something he's used to yet. So I think those those things of context really matter. But then there's the thing that makes this scene really, really interesting. He didn't kill Riddler. The Joker stopped him. There's like a lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, Batman and Joker, two sides of the same coin. It, it it makes this book almost more interesting in a way, uh, where Joker's got that whole speech in White Knight where he says, "The only reason that I haven't killed you is because I I don't want to. I always take you just to where you." All, just I give you just enough that you can take. I make you better. The Joker stopping the blade but putting his hand up. That 
that's because like I, I totally buy it too that's my thing um I've always been of the opinion that Joker does not want to kill Batman. I feel like if you're writing a story with the Joker and, and the Joker's ultimate motivation is to kill Batman, your story's on shaky ground to me. As as far as being like, it can still be a good story, but it's probably not a great Joker story. Um, and to have the Joker be the one that stops Batman from killing when that's usually what he wants to do, though, is make Batman cross that line and kill someone. It's funny. It's a joke. Um, broadly speaking, we can define a joke as you're expecting A, you get chicken, uh, that being you're expecting a logical conclusion then you get something that is unexpected um so like the joke why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side you're expecting an actual punchline you're expecting something funny because you know how jokes work but to get the answer to get to the other side is just such a flat thing that that's what makes it funny is it's it's not what you're expecting um, so you're expecting a story where the Joker and the Riddler both want to kill Batman for the Joker to, you know, smile again. What, what, what are we expecting here? We're expecting some kind of resolution that the Joker finds funny. And what would the Joker find funnier than doing what... Batman would never expect from him, which is stopping him from becoming a murderer. What's the line here? Later in Arkham, I asked Joker why he'd saved me. He asked me if I knew the difference between a joke and a riddle. I said no. He said when I figured out, I'd understand. What separates me from them? I have lines, right? I can stop. I have limits. They can't control themselves. I can. I'm good. They're bad. They kill. I don't. That's what everyone thinks. But it's not true. What separates me from them is a hand on a knife. His hand. And now you know I'm not noble. I'm not some knight in the dark. I'm just what he made me. I am just what the Joker made me. Oh. Kuma Ranger says, I kind of see that scene as the Joker wanting to be the, the only victim of Batman. Yeah, there's that, and, and then there's this, like, you know, the Joker wants to leave a scar, right? He wants to to leave an impact in a big way, and so what leaves more of an impact than, obviously, this, where in Batman trying to kill someone, the Joker's the one that stopped him. The Joker, in Batman's own words, saved him. That's funny. This is interesting. Um... So anyway, Selena talks to him and says the difference between a joke and a riddle is who cares. Um, you are who he made you, fine. And I'm whatever the horrors of my life made me, fine. All our sins, all our earned tragedies, all of it, all that damn pain, it's all here with us, it is us, and I'm sure it's all meaningful or hilarious or philosophical or deep or something or everything. We could spend our whole lives mired in the complexities, but really compared to us, compared to you and me, what we have or could have, all that pain we have, Honestly, who cares? 
Say it again. But this time, you poor boy, don't demand. Please, just ask me. Bruce says, will you marry me? And she says, yes. This is a very existentialist issue. Uh, what does it mean to be a joke? What does it mean to be a riddle? What does anything mean? What kind of meaning can you derive from life? What kind of explanation can you get? And the answer is none. So who cares? All you can do is try to be happy. Um, what's that line? Nothing we do matters, then the only thing that matters is what we do, is uh, Steve's favorite quote from Angel. And I, yeah, I stand by that one. Um, just the act of existing <laughs> becomes a, a form of protest against the universe. The, the act of being happy, of finding some happiness in the, in a absurd world, um, is is assigning a meaning to the absurdity. And so, who cares what you almost did or what you what they made you do? You didn't, you're here now. We'll try for happiness. I don't know. It's um It's an interesting scene. Talk about the art some because it is a very art heavy issue and there's a lot done with facial expressions and shadow. Uh, I like that we don't see Bruce's eyes in this opening. That his head is filled with all the victims. All these faces look really good. Everybody's smiling. Um, which just makes it even sadder. A lot of mood is conveyed with the shading on here. Riddler with the light, Joker with the light, Batman in shadow. Uh, Bruce, you don't see his eyes until he decides in the uh, final panel in the sequence down here to uh, continue the story after uh, some support from Selena, since he's kind of drowning in the sorrow of it. Um, a lot of cool dynamic action. I love these diagonal panels. It just makes it, it makes you read faster, look at it faster rather. Um, sound effects are always cool too. A lot of classics, pals, a lot of pals in there. Um, it looks good. Mm -hmm. Anything else jumping out at me from the art? Oh, yeah, let's talk about the, the page of the stabbing. Okay, so this is just, you know, fundamentally a great use of the page turn. In a comic, as Batman stabs, we have blood coming out of the Riddler's face through blocking. Um, and then we get panel one, the Joker's hand. Panel two, the Joker smirking. Panel three, the Joker smiling. Now that's funny. The detail in his face, the, the like, evilness of that grin... It feels like you. there's literally light in his eyes. It feels genuine again in a way that it hasn't before. Um, like we had earlier issues in this, this arc where he's trying to smile, but it's, it's kind of dead. It's flat. It's not really f him smiling. It's, it's a photography smile. It's, it's, you know, your school photo smile of Now compare now rewind the video, compare that to when I was laughing about um the Jedi library. <laughs> I just look how much of my face changes between Fake Smile 
real smile. Um, and this, it's it's twisted, it's evil looking, but it's a real smile. It's got so much, uh, creep. It's it's creepy. It's eerie, but it's he looks actually happy. It's is that it? It's not just the smile with the mouth. It's it's the smile with the eyes. Uh, um, and then bursting out laughing as everyone else feels ashamed. I like that. Batman defeated Riddler not smart enough to know what it would take to make the Joker laugh. Um, it's pretty good. Catwoman in a post-sex scene drawn tastefully in a believable manner that is not exploitative of her what <laughs> compare this to um frank miller's vicky vale walking around the apartment and lingerie and getting just a big ass panel literally of her ass uh whereas selena's like yeah she's got a nightshirt on and some underwear that's reasonable and it looks good I like the mascara running uh, for her crying. That's cool. I'm trying to figure out how they're going to do Batman and Selena Kyle getting married, though. Or Batman, and Catwoman, Bruce Wayne, and Selena Kyle. Because it's known that Selena's a major jewel, or a major, like, criminal. She's even accused of like 200 murders in this continuity i don't think they did did that ever get like officially wrapped up like as far as the the law was concerned i think so yeah yeah that got transferred over to someone else but still she'd be like a highly suspected person and everyone knows she's catwoman then it's a little little questionable um i'm sure it'll be addressed on some level Not really important to the story, but I'm sure it'll be addressed. Good ass issue, guys. Um, great arc. And that was the conclusion of the War of Jokes and Riddles. Um, as far as early days Batman stuff, I really like it. It's it's up there. I know I'm, I'm hearing other people put it up there with year one and um, Long Halloween. I'm going to need to give it another read or two before I, I give it that kind of praise. But I definitely see where they're coming from with that. It's really good. It's got a lot to say. Um, I will say that one reason maybe not to put it up there is... For the Long Halloween and Year One, you don't really need to know a lot besides just like who Batman is, that he has a rogues gallery kind of thing. Um, those are pretty contextless going in to be able to appreciate what's brilliant about them. Um, Long Halloween a little less so than Year One, but still, it's it's very little is needed to go into that book. This, I feel, part of what makes it so brilliant is knowing who the Joker is, knowing who the Riddler is, knowing who Batman and who Catwoman are, um, and knowing Kite Man's reputation in the comics. So this requires a lot more context to be able to really get it, I feel, than uh, than those other ones. Um, so it's it's potentially just as good just not quite as accessible i guess i'd say but yeah good ass book
<sighs> tired. How's everybody doing? Going well in the comments, I hope. Oh, Philip Kelton says, what did I miss? Just the whole show. <laughs> uh... Okay. I'm going to move on to the trade for this week. So I'm going to leave y'all in the comments. You enjoy yourselves. Behave now. Because I'm going to talk about this. Welcome to another episode of Trade Talk. Uh, this week we have Zorro by Paper Cuts. Uh, Publishing House, Volume 2, Drownings. Um, so the, it looks like there are four volumes of this series by Paper Cuts released. Um, I think I'm only going to be able to get three of them in total because I got the third one. doesn't look like I can get access to the fourth. Uh, this came out in like 2005, 2006. It's over 10 years old at this point. I'm not terribly surprised that I can't get access to that stuff. I'm annoyed. Um, this is kind of tangential to a review of the thing itself, but I'm annoyed with Zorro's copyright holder. Uh, the fact of the matter is Zorro is still owned by the heirs of the um, original creator, Johnston McCulley. And that's okay, but... If you're going to have owner, if you're going to maintain ownership on a character who is over a hundred years old, almost or who is almost a hundred years old, then you need to do a better job of making sure material that you are licensing him for, licensing him for, is actually accessible to the public. Um, this is the second thing of Don McGregor doing comic books of Zorro that I have found where I'm enjoying it, but I'm not going to be able to read all of it because it's only available for a short time. That's aggravating. Uh, let me grab something real quick and I'll, I'll explain further. Let's see if I can manage this. Without breaking stuff. Woo! It's like the table trick. Zorro the Dailies, the first year. Written by Don McGregor, with art by Thomas Yates. This was a newspaper comic strip. I did a review of this on Trade Tuck already. You can go check that out if you want. This collects the first year of daily newspaper comic strips. Do yourself a favor. Go look up the second year. You can find a volume of it. They did do it. Guess what? It was made with 50 copies exclusively in Germany. Like three years ago. This came out in the... What is... When was this out? Like 2007? <laughs> The original newspaper comic strip came out in uh, the early 2000s. This was collected and published in the um, late 2000s, mid to late 2000s by Image. And it's never gotten a volume two for wide release because they don't think it will sell. We'll then make the strips available online. Same with this. Zorro wants the the company that owns the rights to Zorro wants to license the character out to a nobody publisher like Paper Cuts. Fine, but you need to have some level of access to it after the fact. After that publisher stops putting it out, Paper Cuts is still around. You can still go to their website and order books. That's mostly kids stuff. You can't get any of these volumes anymore. It's not continued in publication. That's not okay to do. It's aggravating. But anyway. So yeah, I'm reading this because I like Dob McGregor on Zorro. This is still, again, you know, context. 
This is mostly for kids. Uh, this, like, you know, middle school age kid kind of stuff. So we continue the um, Zoro and Eluia's. Ah. Elulia. Their trek west. And, of course, they come across another couple in need of help. This is a woman who is running away from her abusive lover with a artist painter. Uh, before Zoro can get there to, like, meet them, in you know, Lilia fall down an ice canyon, and they spend several pages just trying to get out as we learn more about these people and their situation. And the villain chasing them, who's the abusive partner, who was formerly a policeman for our, um, New Orleans. I love the Zoro. Like, okay, here's one of my favorite things about Zoro. Batman fights crime. Superman fights, uh, you know, global threats. Um, the Flash fights, you know, everyday uh, crime kind of stuff. You know, all these, these characters, they fight bad guys who are criminals. Zoro fights cops. Zoro fights the law. And the law doesn't win. I love that about Zoro. Zoro's a revolutionary figure. Um, so anyway, even even when the guy's not a cop, Zoro's still fighting cops. I love it. Uh, they spend a lot of time getting the fuck out of this canyon. Um, anyway, once they do, they're riding... Uh, through more valley, valleys across the great American West. Um, and they decide to go and take a bath in one of the hot springs. And we get this big romantic kissy face moment. Which is fine. Cool with that. Uh, you know, I, normally I, I tend to roll my eyes at a lot of, um, romance stuff attached to superhero comics just because I feel like it's a little played out it's it's always it always just feels tacked on Zoro being such a romantic figure in a lot of ways um I think it just works for him better it just fits his character better I always associate Zoro with you know kind of that that idyllic romanticism of the hero gets the girl kind of thing at the end of the day um and so it works for me in a way that, like, I, I'd all, I'm always more critical with other characters. Um, I like this. She, she takes off his mask because she wants to see the man that she's kissing. It's a cool moment. Uh, a lot of shit about background of the villains, background of the villains... There's a raft, uh, and finally Zoro and the, um, innocent, uh, people get to meet up when the bad guy shoots a Native American who has been helping this, uh, couple running away. Uh, Zoro hears gunshots and immediately runs off to go save the day. Tornado swimming across a river with Zoro on his back shooting a gun is kind of cool. And yes, Zoro does have a gun. It's a flint lock. Um, I like the way he uses the gun, too. He doesn't, like, shoot the guy. He shoots his gunpowder so he can't reload. That's cool. That's clever. I like that. Uh, then he picks up the Native American's bow and arrow and uses it to stop a stampeding buffalo that's about to kill the damsel in distress scene. That's cool. Neat dynamic little moment of action. Uh, this is very anime uh, style art. Look at um, no, look at Lilia's face down here. Like the, the forehead, forehead throbbing, the bashful um, lines across the face. This is clearly manga-inspired art. I said anime earlier, but manga-inspired art. Uh, that's kind of funny. I'd watch a Zoro anime if it didn't suck. 
Anyway, they, you know, get back to this raft and start going down river on it, uh, looking to try to, you know, get away from the bad guys, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. I like this little moment of this guy who's more of an artist, but uh, is the one, you know, saving this woman. It's in there drawing Zoro, and Zoro's got a cool speech about how he always feels like he's has to excuse himself or or act like he's wasting time to um, to get a chance to draw, since Don Diego de la Vega is more of a, a Renaissance man, as it were. And so he's like, no, don't, never apologize to me for drawing, because I always hate when I do that. It's a sweet, cool little moment. Uh, I always like the idea that, that like, Diego always, uh, obviously always puts on this, like, kind of like a fop personality where he always exaggerates and, and acts like a, you know, like a coward and all that stuff. And, and like, he's too, um, too much of a tight ass, uh, you know, whatever, to do anything, to be a man of action. And... Like the that the way that a lot of people would write that is that's the act, but Zoro's the real man. Um, and I really like the idea that yeah, he exaggerates it. It is still on some level an act, but there's more of him to that than people realize. Th that he is he's not like disgusted by violence or anything like that, but he is legitimately interested in the things that he pretends to be obsessed about as Don Diego. So I like that a lot. Anyways, bad guys board the raft and there's an action scene. Uh, a lot of fighting going down. There's Zoro's under surprise attack so he's not ready for it. And the bad guy starts to drown him. Hence the name, Drownings. Um, this is not complicated metaphor. There's a lot about a lot talked about here about this feeling of restrictiveness of inescape of drowning in your sorrows and and your problems dragging you down uh same with the last volume scars had a lot of the ideas of like oh well you're left with all these marks of life that that you can't escape from that that things always seem to stay there and remind you and drag you back to the past um so there's you know, it's, it's not a complex metaphor, but again, it's more for, uh, you know, middle schoolers and stuff like that. Um, action, waterfall, uh, tornado does a thing to save the day, because tornado's awesome. All of this where, like, the girl's still on the raft and it's about to go over the waterfall, so Zoro quickly runs and swings his whip onto a log in the waterfall and jumps and swings. I love this line he has. This has to be one of the most wickedly insane things I've ever tried. Oh, that's pretty cool. And it saves the girl and they get back to land. Cool stuff. This is, again, this is just fun. This is just enjoyable to read. Uh, it's not complex. Don McGregor just knows how to tell a fun story and have some level of commentary. And he just gets who Zoro is, which makes it a really fun thing to, to look at. The art's not in, like especially impressive. Again, it's got very manga influence to it. But that's fine. It's whatever. Um, it still looks pretty good. Even though I like, you know, I'd prefer something more um, I'd prefer to see Zorro as drawn by a Latino artist, to be honest with you. Uh, but, all fairness, it looks good for what it's trying to be. It's nice, simplistic, I imagine fairly quick to draw art. Uh, you know, Alulia, Alulia is drawn attractively, but not, you know, overly sexualized to the point where I'm like, okay, come on, it's a kid's book, or okay, come on. Stop dwelling on it. I have a little maturity here. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just good. It's it's fun. Uh, you know, this cost me like two bucks, I think. So it was worth getting. Uh, 
again, I got it mainly for Don McGregor on Zorro because I think he right he really gets the character. Uh, even when it's something so simplistic, uh, like not simplistic sounds insulting. When it's something more uh, just for fun, just to be an easier to read story for uh, you know younger kids, I think this is this is good material for that. Um, yeah, that's that's all I got for this. Uh, two short trade talks. Got another one for next week, and in, unless I can find volume four, that's probably going to be the end of this. Uh, if anyone like is in a library or, or bookstore or something and sees the paper cut Zorro volume four called Flight, let me know. I know I don't have a big audience. I've got an even smaller audience as comes to Zorro fans, but if you see it, let me know. Buy it. I'll buy it back from you. I'll pay for shipping and all that stuff um, because I just would like to have the complete uh, thing. And again, it's it's just annoying. My, my biggest complaint about this is that the the company that owns or the, the affiliate that owns Zorro's copyright does not do a good job of maintaining um collections and, and things of the character. That's just that's poor that's poor management of your intellectual property. Anyway, that'll do it for this episode of Trade Talk. And everyone that stuck through uh on comic reviews, thanks um very much. Let's see here. Uh Philip Kelton was talking Zoro fight injustice while well, moral injustice. I like Zoro for what it means to be Batman. Yeah. Um, everyone, thanks for watching comic reviews. See ya.